He's a globally renowned hospitality guru and founder of Tony Chi New York. For over 30 years, Tony has been bringing visionary insights and a holistic hands-on approach to developing ground-up, high-velocity design projects that transform global business. His long portfolio includes projects for Rosewood London, Intercontinental Geneva, Andaz Tokyo, Park Hyatt Sh Shanghai, the upcoming Rosewood Hong Kong, and New York's Car Carlisle Hotel. Today, Tony will share with us his approach to hotel design, invisible design, and insights into the Rosewood London, and his thoughts around his career and the future for hotels. Please join me in welcoming Tony to the stage. It has been 35 years uh, I stumbled on this sort of you call it design life. I don't even know how I started it. But honestly, Melbourne was one of those critical cities that inspired me quite a bit. And it was certainly was it one of those 35 years memory uh, that I accumulated uh, in my life. So when I started this design life, <clears throat> actually I want a life, I didn't want to work. So, so I was very clear about how I'm not going to work every day. I can do what I want, when I want, and the thing that's not restrictive. So hospitality came about. It came about strictly from a restaurant point of view. So what, what did this, is there okay? Is there a, okay, is this a, okay. So, so I started, I mean, I started this long, long, long time ago with the restaurant design. Then I somehow I find this thing along the way that I know it is true that I'm telling you, but the rest of it is not true at all. But why I did the restaurant? Mainly because it was a fundamental way to bring people together. It was like a park. It's a public environment. People go to a restaurant, they're happy. And then no one ever sat in the restaurant, in which I have never seen it. So, so with this entire journey, I started to go through the learning process. And I did this project, which I learned quite a bit. I said, this is exactly what I don't want to do, this particular project. And this was done for United Nations, for the head of the states. So when the president of the, of the country visit, then I said, well, this is the environment they must be in. And I absolutely hated it. And this is something that conformed to their standard, United Nations, but it's not to me. So I put it out to say, this should not be interior design. This should not dictate our life. We should do what we like. And how do we build something we like and yet still stay sustainable? In the design business or am I in the, in the, in the business of design? I mean, you look at it, it's sort of which one should come first? You know, and I was a time that, yeah, absolutely should be the business of design. I can somehow use the business know-how to make design sustainable. Or I can simply say, forget everything else, the design is all I want to do, and I use the business part to keep my lust, my love alive. To this day, I'm still going back and forth, okay? And through this going back and forth, I learned a great deal of things. Uh, Inspiration come from these findings. Inspiration come from everything I do, and this is the project that I sort of find that inspiration. People say, well, why do you create a pool that's somewhat elevated 1.5 meter above the floor? I mean, I could have a sunken floor. I could have a pool completely recessed. I said, you know, when the building was going up in Shanghai, and then the engineer keep on asking, said, where do you want the pool? And I said, I don't know. And I said, I don't know for five years. So the day came, they said, you have to tell me where you want the pool. I said, I'd like the pool to be exactly the same level as the Huangpu River, with the city river. And they said, how does that work? I said, well, get me up there. So 
So they, they strap me in the little cage, hoist me up in the air, and I say, keep going, keep going, and then we wind up at 385 meters. And that's exactly where we are, because I want to be at that level swimming and be completely aligned with the river. I mean, make believe. Did it work? No. Most of the people didn't know the difference. But anyhow, <laughs> um, so therefore, I kind of believe that everything we do, doesn't matter what I do, but the thing we do should have a very clear purpose. And now some developer may come to me and say, you know, <clears throat> I would like you to do the job. And I say, why me? He said, well, you can add some value. He's a brand can add some value so I can sell more condo. I said, oh, that sounds great. That's your purpose, but really not mine. So how do we find something that we can have a common purpose to the designer, to the, to the vendor, to the partners? So in this approach, I sort of taking the design center element, and I really look at the design is, it's a venture. You know, it is a project. It is a life in the making at that moment of your life. Every project does. So this, in this case, I say, if I have to do a project, what do I need around this project to keep this project alive, to keep me alive, uh, to be sustainable. When I say sustainable it means longevity. You know, we, 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 we have very inspiration talk this morning, which I hear about sustainability. Equally, we need to somehow be very sensitive about what does it mean sustainable. This is not about just having something lead certified label to tell you that you are sustainable, but rather developing a design, a place, something tangible, or perhaps something intangible that can sustain with us in a very short lifetime. So, design that needs element around it. And all the things that you see up there, the retail, F&B, social spaces, all these are commercial definitions define what it means. Of course, you heard that a lot, the area program. You must have an area program. So how do we define that? I mean, are we just a facilitator and taking the numbers and plug in? Or are we here to redefine the meaning of it, right? Then you look at the brand concept, brand. What the hell does that mean? People say, Tony, you're a brand. I say, I didn't know that. <laughs> Which part? <laughs> so oftentimes, I find these words has very little meaning to the thing I do. Then you come to hotel and residences. I say, which one come first? <laughs> I mean, it is a kind of strange thing. Hotel is residence, and residence is somewhat a hotel. So how do you separate that? Then the service, a service, of course, is a must. So why is the service formed at the bottom right corner? So, so these are the things coming to something that I ponder every day. Now, of course, with the architects, my fellow colleagues, why are we always in the pissing match? Why do you always say the interior designers stay in the box and we'll do the envelope? I say, well, does that mean you are a package designer? Am I a makeup artist? Is that how it works? Uh, so, so often I say, well, if you look out the window, wherever my eyes stop, basically that's the end of your scope. <laughs> Depends how far you can see, right? So, so these are the things that we sometimes look at the approach. Really, it's holistic. So in my case, I oftentimes look at the program. And why do we have such a program? For what purpose? So of course, people say, well, the back of the house, I need 25 square, uh, 25%. Uh, the hallway, I need 10%, et cetera. All these numbers that drive the job. We say, why don't we define what it means? If you have a corridor walking from point A to point B, what matters to you? Is it point A that matters to you, or is it point B that matters to you, or anywhere in between? How many people walk through a corridor and say, oh, I'm completely inspired? You must be kidding. Um, you know, lucky, lucky in my life, uh, I sort of say the lucky part starts with three parts. Uh, you know, it's like a baseball, three strike, you out, so I'm up to the third. So just, just so you know, I'm almost out, almost out of the game. Part one, shaping legacy, really not mine. And I think I'm very fortunate in my life that people come to me um, asking for advice, asking what should we do? You can build a brand. The brand that you build 
has really a lot of layers, the emotion layers, uh, the visual layers. Uh, you know, has this sort of things that I can't explain. I said, well, invisible design, right? He said, well, he said, yeah, if that's how you decided to call it. I said, yeah, I'm pretty good making people's money disappear. <laughs> And some people might say, well, show me the money. I said, well, I'm the wrong guy, right? <laughs> so, so in this case, I think this is actually an interesting project that I worked on for, uh, I want to say probably 12, 13 years. London opened only seven years ago, I think. Then, of course, my, my dear colleague, Bar Studio, followed up with Beijing. I think the entire idea, the way I did it, I told the owner, I said, you know, to launch a brand, to be successful about it, and I think on the scientific part of it, we need to have a strategy, so to speak. I said, to do this thing right, we gotta somehow look at the world, connecting the dots. Um, London is important, Paris is important, Beijing is important, of course, Hong Kong, the flagship store, is important, and New York, you can't have the complete ass without two cheeks, right? London, New York, they're sort of make one complete ass. So, so, so looking at this, I said, well, we'll do this thing correctly by opening London. You know, London defines a formality. London defines great many things uh, in our life. I look at all the English-speaking countries and look at all the colonies they have conquered. They have taught us not just the language, but the certain way of life, whether right or wrong. So you use that as a base, and then you go from there. So I said to the owner, I said, we'll create three hotels for you. Uh, then you can go everywhere you want in the world. Uh, one that is a grand hotel, very grand, the grandeur of the hotel. Uh, and that hotel should be located in a very grand city, very mature city, very authentic and very mature. Then second will be a royal hotel. That royal hotel can be in the city like Beijing, right? The royal city where king and queen lives once upon a time. And the last is a colonial hotel. If we have all these three types of hotels, more or less we cover the world. You look at all the countries, all the cities being colonized, there's a certain culture uh, in that environment. And somehow you need to grasp that. It's not the English, it's not the Spanish, it's not the Dutch but it's that mentality, it's that whole entire DNA uh, during the colonization. And same thing with the Grand City. So I decided, well, London, let's just call that a Grand Hotel. So we did that. Then, of course, Beijing for Bar Studio that did the Beijing, it's already called the Royal Hotel. So you can look at two hotels distinctively different, not necessarily by interior design and or the architecture design, but rather by the service package, okay? The formality is very different. The feel is very different, okay? So of course, with this entire idea, then we launched the entire brand. Now, of course, Paris opened a few months ago. Uh, New York, supposed to open two years ago, and uh, you know me, so four years behind schedule. Um, so Carlisle sort of is gonna fall be the last one to do the grand finale. We have Hong Kong opening coming up at the end of the year. So you see this Rosewood London. And you know, I wanted, uh, of course I wanted a sense of place. And then truly everyone talking about sense of place. And you can talk about it, but you have to live it. So how do we truly develop a hotel with, with a great sense of place? You really know that you are there. But I don't really mean doing the cliche stuff, huh? I really don't mean, look out the window, you see the Eiffel Tower, here I am in Paris. That's not what I mean. You really did, you really feel that this place has certain things that is very different than any other hotel in any other city. So I've decided to decorate the room. It's about accumulation, right? It's about curation of goods and services. Uh, now I imagine that, that an Englishman travel around the world over hundreds of years and collect all the goodies and brought it home then you have it all there, but not in the most obvious way. Now, of course, people say, well, the suite is about size. I said, well, I don't agree. I think the suite is about richness. So in this case, that's a little suite that we did, um, and we call it the manor house. And this definition has a lot of meaning to it. You may say, well, what does it mean, a manor house? Why don't you call it a manor suite or presidential suite? We decided to call the houses because of the British things, right? The manor house is really defined the city, 
Now, again, and I, I use this to tell you the Rosewood, the Rosewood basically, there are three types of Rosewood hotels. There are two types that define these three types of hotel. One of them, of course, is the manor house that's located in the city. Anything urbanistic, we call it manor house. If it is in the country, we call it estate. But the estate must have a driveway, the garden, et cetera. So, so Hong Kong would be interesting to see because it's a pure, I look at it as pure estate. Right, and I want to say, hey, first thing I want to design is the boat. Because you can't cross the river without a boat. Right, it's not about interior design, it is about the experience. It's about the arrival experience or the departure experience. So there's certain elements that I work with that I sort of bring this thing in. And then now you're looking at what's on the picture here <coughs> for London. You know the key part of my doing is always about about what not to do. It's not about what to do. I go through every job telling myself what I should not do. I mean, there are thousands of good ideas I can put all on there, but, but the, the, the key is what not to do. So in this case, this building was in a very poor condition. Partially limestone were all painted. Uh, it was previously an insurance company and occupied it by Marriott for few years, and they actually painted the limestone to look green, right? because the color is green. <clears throat> so to remove the color, to remove the stone, to go through the heritage process, was that all that worthy? Yes, it was, because I learned something. I learned something through this process of how to restore a building. I've never, never done that in my life. So for that, this project is actually quite memorable for me. I learned something. Then, of course, London weather, the wet weather, the cold weather, you need a vestibule. Does anybody know what vestibule is? The American call it the vestibule. And I say, you know, the vestibule is not romantic. It's meaningless in many ways. Of course it is functional. You know, during the cold, bloody winter day, you go through the vestibule, it blocks the wind. But it's not romantic. How do I make it romantic? So I made it 10 times the size. I call it a gallery. Right? Now, I use it as a device to manage people. You know, people are like water. You're going to channel them where you want them to go. Now, it is a 300-room hotel. I couldn't possibly have 300, all the people that, that flock right into the lobby. So I break it all down. I mean, using the vestibule to say, if you walk in, to the left, you go to the lobby lounge. To the right, you go to the bar. You go straight in. You come to the hotel lobby. So I sort of break it all up a bit. Okay? Then... Uh, then, of course, the lobby itself, it has a great meaning to it, mainly because we discovered along the way uh, this location was the birthplace of Charles Dinkin. I mean, there's no better sense of place at all. I mean, no one ever prostitutes Charles Dinkin, right, in a commercial way. So neither we are going to do that, but rather taking it as pure inspiration. So we did the entire lobby really based on the fox and the hunt. There are, there are table, the reception table is called the fox, the concierge table is called the hum. You have two tables, right? Then, of course, having a forest painting in the middle. We commissioned the painting. So, so in a way that people, anyone that's curious about the story, then they can, they can ask. Then lastly, all the bric-a-brac that we have there is that's a very Britishness, right? Because the whole idea, I want it to be very Britishness. It must have some kind of a sense of humor. So you'll see the Beatles, you see the DB4, you see the soldier. All those things, I find them in the portobello market. Tiny little thing in the flea market. Then we'll clean them all up, put them in the pedestal, in the glass box. You know, it's not about how much it's worth. It's about how much effort you put into it. With all that effort, I'm happy to share with everyone else. And that's not an art package. It's not a Picasso, it's a Matisse. It's absolutely, to me, it's a priceless, but to a lot of people, it's absolutely worth nothing. Some of these little boxes cost about $10, right? So, so we're very happy to share it. And that makes the lobby some kind of a hobby room, in a way. Right? Then, of course, uh, the, of course, the artwork further. Then, of course, the branding issue. How do we create something that represents the city? Uh, how do we create something that represents the brand? How do we create a room uh, that cater uh, to the type of clientele we will have? It's not that I don't love my wife or my partner, we must have two beds. I think I truly believe, I mean, just me, always believing yours and mine, his and hers. And I think this is fundamentally, we have certain things 
in each one of us. And I think we need to respect that in design. So you convince the client and say, let's do this. Your closet, my closet, your bathroom, my bathroom. Well, there's no point to go to the bathroom and to have a race with your wife about who brushes the teeth fast, right? Uh, <clears throat> uh, then, of course, for the, for the Hong Kong, Hong Kong was a colony. <clears throat> so we, we look at from this colony, how do we create something that represents the city through the heritage of time? It's like a time passage. So I really wanted something that, not that I didn't like the architecture, but how do I make the architecture disappear a bit? So I took the least favorable part of the building and made an entrance out of it. And there's all the ventilation around this entire penetration. And we basically created an entire stone facade. It's a, it's a ventilation shaft, basically. And I gave the more valuable part of the real estate to someone else as a profit generator. I certainly don't need it. My residents, they don't need such a valuable location for entrance. So, so we sort of shifted away at using something that least favorable and turn it into something actually quite exquisite without that stone carving, ventilation, double layers of space. Um, you know, so create an entrance that people feel like this is home. Don't ask me the tree came first or the lobby came first. Actually, we want to have a tree and we build a lobby around this imagine, imaginable tree. We got the lobby built, but we still haven't found a tree. <laughs> so we should go to Hong Kong at the end of the year, see if the tree is there. I'm still working on it. Okay. Okay. So the brand itself, the Carlisle. Unfortunately, I can't share with you the, what the Carlisle looks like, but actually Carlisle uh, is a one part of the modern American heritage. So how do we transform that? How do we uh, define a room? Only the wall can talk what, what JFK did in that room. Uh, how do we create this sort of mysterious, mature myth of a hotel? Uh, you know, there are great many hotels in New York, particularly downtown nowadays, all the hip hotels, and who the hell is going to stay uptown at 76th Street and Madison Avenue, so far out of the way. So where is the value of all this? Okay. It's, a, it's a $10 taxi away, but it's far enough. So how do we do all this? How do we bring the park into you? How do we become park, part of the, the museums? So all these things is all part of the Carlisle in the making. Then through this process, of course, the second part of my life, uh, dealing with revi reviving the tradition. And I think this part of the learning process sort of got me into sort of a tradition, respecting the tradition. Okay? We are in the hospitality business, and what is the tradition of hospitality? We can design a great hotel. What good is a hotel without hospitality? And what does it mean? Does that mean that you get a bowl of fruits on your table and then the job is done? Or is it something that truly comes from their heart? So hospitality uh, is, a, is, it is, a, it is a mission that I seek for the last 34, 35 years, and then continue to see that. So now, for tradition part of it, I had this great opportunity in Tokyo to create this sort of a urban renew, the old part of the Tokyo getting revived. So I wanted to take that part of that tradition and roll them right back into this sort of a modernized, Japanese city. So to begin with this, uh, I mean, I could show you the lobby first, but to begin with this, I'm, an, I'm not a complicated designer, but everything has its purpose. In this case, sure, you have Charlie Whitney's art on the ceiling. Why Charlie? Why this? This, I'll make a brief, and I share with the owner. When the owner says, Tony, what are you designing this time for me? I said, well, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do for you. So I give him a piece of paper. This paper is called washi paper, handcrafted paper. He looked at it and said, beautiful washi. Then I fold it, and he said, oh. I said, yes, I altered the memory of the paper. As you, as a developer, you build a building to the day the building opened to the public, as I just fold the paper. The day this building opened to the public, new memory will be made. So I wanted the artwork to have some kind of a memory. So the material is a bandwood. It's 
So to bend the wood, the wood must have a memory, correct? Then at the same time, and with the entire building materials, it's all washi paper. I have one material throughout the whole job. I actually didn't even want to have any sign. I wanted the entire hotel made by paper. And the fire department looked at me and said, you want a what? <laughs> I said, I want to have a paper hotel. So that's how far I got. And there was a lot of fighting. Uh, well, skip that part. Now, this is the lobby of the Andas Tokyo. Um, you know, I look at the lobby. The lobby has life. The life has two parts, the sun and the moon. As we, you know, I live in South America, I learn to respect the sun is the sweat of God and the moon is the tear of God. So you have to have both element in anyone's life. So in this case, I said, you know, if I'm going to turn down service at 8 o'clock at night, why should I not turn down the lobby at midnight? So I built this entire shoji panel, 4.7 meter tall panel, motorize it, and you can close the whole lobby. So imagine you're the guest that, can, that comes home at 2 o'clock in the morning. This lobby is absolutely quiet. And you know the building's at rest. And you know this place, you will sleep very well. And these are the actually small little gestures, right, to give you a hint. The hint is about sleep well, without a word. Rather than somebody say, good night, have a good night. Do you really need somebody to tell you that before you go to bed? I mean, the environment should be able to embrace that idea. <clears throat> then, of course, the adjacent part of this entire part of the city, we had about four uh, CD blocks to work with. So this is the building number 10. That was the building number 9. Here's the building number 10. So to create, again, for an apartment building, I say, why would anyone want to expose their home to a stranger? So I think, again, I didn't put the entrance in the front. I put the entrance way in the back. So this is actually the entrance to a, to a home, but you really can see the door. Isn't that lovely? Where is your house? Right? The same thing about the, uh, every developer say, you know, every year I have to maintain my elevator lobby. There's so much wear and tear and all that. I said, don't worry about it. I'll build a new steel this time for you. So I built it like a bunker. But again, these materials, you hand polish them, you craft them. Right? You turn something so ordinary into something extraordinary. Isn't that what we do? It is something so spectacular. Why would you want to do anything about that? Leave it alone. So in this case, we took something quite ordinary, black steel, hand buffed it, polished it, shaped it, turned that into an entire elevator lobby. Okay. Now, the last part of my life is about learning. Okay. This is never end. When I was younger, architect, designer, I, we hated the decorator. We called them decorator. You know, so we, we didn't quite understand what, 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 what they do. Only now, I sort of retreat a little bit. I said, you know, these guys really know how to live. They spend their entire life curating lovable things that matters to them. May not matter to anybody else, but it matters a lot to them. Whether it's the art, the flower, the tchotchke, the breath of bag, you name it. So I, I sort of gone through that and now knowing uh, that the people that I've met and the job that I've done, and I do precisely the same. And I no longer taking spaces, the, the space I used to create, so aggressively. Now it's kind of more forgiving. Spaces are calmer, small rooms, give space, some space to decorate for a space that people can begin to curate. Then you can use every day of your life to edit, to edit the things that suit you in, for the season for each day. So in my case, sure, my house always under renovation. Of course, I change the artwork every other day. I move things around. Uh, you know, it's a part of home living. Uh, and I think for commercial living, why not be the same? So I sort of taking that approach, apply to the job I do. Uh, to me, the fabric. Uh, uh, people say, can you, can you design a fabric line for me? I say, why? But I don't mind to create something we must use every day, so I create a line absolutely no pattern. 
It's just simple textures. It's not that every texture will have the full color wave. No, I don't. It's only five pieces of fabric. That's all. And then the textile maker says, I can't do this. It's not financially feasible. I go, oh. right. Now, lastly, of course, New York on us. I did this thing probably around 14 or 15 years ago. When the hire came to me, said, we want to create a brand called Hyatt, I call, call Andas. I said, well, first of all, you have to agree with me that you won't call it Hyatt. Or create anything but Hyatt. So they agree, so we create Andas. Andas represent, of course, uh, A to Z is a life, personal life. So this is the first one. It's called Andas 1.0. What you saw in Tokyo is Andas 2.0. In this case, we're located directly across the street from New York Library. So why would I want to build anything else? I will build a library. If I can put my guests in the library, I will have a smashing hotel. But since the library won't let my guests stay in there, I said, I'll build one for you. So I went to the library. I said, guys, what do you need? They said, we need storage room. I said, I got the space. <laughs> <laughs> so on that, New York is the extension of New York Library. <clears throat> and then, of course, the guest room. Uh, every room I do, actually quite thoughtful, mainly because I have to think about the user quite a bit. Right? Not that I am womanizer, but I think the women use the bedroom far superior and far thoughtful than we are. So of course I give her a place where she can re refresh herself before she goes anywhere else. Of course I give her a day bed. Of course I give her all the amenities that she needs. But for the men, we have a different set of standards. Not that, but our standard may not be as good, but it's different. So we'll do, I'll do that as well. And now, of course, on this, <clears throat> the last journey of this life, I, I look at this project that I did, and I don't know why I keep on uh, looking at this project. And these projects are all over, I don't know, 15, 17 years old. And I look at them, I say, they haven't changed one bit. They age pretty well. And they're even better than the day I vision it. So, so to me, uh, I, I realize everything I aim to do is creating something, allow it to evolve through time. As myself, evolve through time. After 35 years, I have a very different purpose doing a job. I don't do great many projects. I'm sure many of you know that. So nowadays, the purpose is completely different. And of course, what is it? I'm still searching. And so for that learning process, uh, i really looking at how do I keep it together. And that foremost is my family and my friends. Uh, so the day I will surrender is the day I call it a day. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to be here in Melbourne because Many years ago, I was here. Um, I had a most memorable time here. The restaurant, the street, the bar, George's Wine Bar, Simon Webb showed me Melbourne. I've never seen before, and I was so inspired. Uh, and I look at Melbourne and say, this is far greater than New York because the scale is much bigger. It's so majestic. I wish New York is like Melbourne, right? But today, I came back, and it's such a Different city has become cozier. Not because it got crowded. You know, the layer has been filled in. And the city is far superior than before. So those philanthropists build you a hell of a city, knowing the city will grow up, knowing the city will be layered them years to come. And I was here more than 20 years ago. So I'm very happy that you brought me back here, and I'm happy that Melbourne gave me this incredible memories. So I want to thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Yeah. I'd now like to invite Angela Biddle, director from Scott Carver, to join you on the stage, and she's going to have a Q&A with Tony. Please join me welcoming Angela. Hi, Angela. That was a great, is this working? Yes, thank you. That was a lovely presentation. I think I'm very inspired. I don't know about the rest of you. Um, you certainly helped me edit my ginormous list of questions. Thank you, Tony. Um, 
I wanted to start with uh, your last thought, actually, in your presentation, which was about coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, working together is success. Um, there were some discussions this morning about the dynamic between designers, owners, and operators, and I'm wondering if perhaps there's a clue in that final thought into how perhaps that relationship could be um, improved, or, or I suppose what the, uh, what the perfect storm is in that oh, statement wow. to make, make a project work seamlessly. I, I think, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I, I think every project, I first always go through the chemistry measuring. Uh, I need to look at myself, how I relate to the city, the site, the, the owner, of course, probably one of the most important thing. Uh, whether the new owner, the old owner, it doesn't really matter. It is a vision that they have. How do I create something far greater than their vision? It is not just a bottom line. They're looking at the ROI, and I think that's very important. But you can simply calculate just you. You have to figure out what you are willing to give. So oftentimes, with a client, usually that's the first session. And if I survive, or he survive, or she survive in the first 10 minutes, then we have a chance to talk about what I'm going to do for you. Uh, so I do go through an extensive time uh, with the client to measure that. And second, I also measure the team. Uh, I'm fortunate to tell you that, uh, yeah, I work with the same team for the last, I don't know, 20 years. So I don't really have to make love to anybody I don't know. So, so in, 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 in this case of my life, I say, yeah, if I get the same team, I'm happy to do the job. Uh, then, of course, architects, uh, the owners, and me, uh, how do we come together? Uh, and the last part of it, on the, of that is, I often say to them, together we are making a symphony. I'd like to know who's going to be the composer. Um, who's going to be the conductor? Let's be very clear. If you want to be the composer and the conductor, I have no problem with the pianist. So what do you want to hire me for? Which part of the job do you want me to do? But if it is not a symphony, then why are you here? <laughs> Fair enough. So with the Rosewood, London, which happens to... <laughs> it's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> uh, with the Rosewood in London, that's my favorite, personal favorite project of yours. Um, thank you for sharing some insight to it. Uh, with that project, it took eight years to come to fruition. Do you, do you think there's some value in a project taking its time to come to life? I know these days we're rushing to get projects mm. built and open, but do you think there's some value to actually letting a project kind of live and breathe and take its time to come to life? Uh, uh, absolutely. I, I think time is everything. We can say, well, the opening day is the combination of all, but if the job takes two years, combination what? The combination of hell. So, so I think in, in our case, uh, I was lucky mainly because the family, at the time I was designing their family compound uh, in Hong Kong that consists of nine houses. Uh, at the time, I really uh, started accumulating uh, uh, arts and decoration and all these things because the owner and I had agreed that we will do procurement around the world. Uh, I was buying things in Europe and have them all consolidate uh, in London, actually. Uh, when the house is well and ready in Hong Kong, then we can ship all the stuff to Hong Kong. So somehow along the way, Rosewood Hotel happened. Uh, so I was lucky to be able to move some of that goodie into the hotel. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, so yes, it's filled with some amazing objects. They've obviously been collected. Um, do you try and control that aspect in all of your projects? All of the little details, the furniture, the accessories, um, right down to the cutlery? And is that something that yeah. you think should be a service that designers offer? Is that something that you see as an added value? Well, I, I think first of all, and I mentioned before, if it is a symphony to you, you know, certainly you're capable to be a composer. Particularly Australia, such a mature country in this part of the world. So you should be able to comprehend all those wonderful sensories and you can compose that to a client somehow if he or she allow you to compose such a beautiful music and allow you to conduct them then you probably need to do all of it and all my project if they want to take any part of that away usually we will back off on the project doesn't matter who or which country yeah, absolutely it's those last little details that really give the soul to the project isn't it so they really do um, add that tactility to a project. So 
Hong Kong is opening at the end of the year, as you mentioned, the Hong Kong flag flagship for the Rosewood. Um, how is that story different from, Ro from the Rosewoods you've done to date? What's going to be the, the big story behind that one? Uh, many years ago, uh, I, I know the family for, for a great many years, and my background was uh, urban planning. So I went to Hong Kong because of that. Uh, there was part of the, uh, the warehouse, which is Jen Sajri East, it was part of that warehouse reviving. Uh, so I met the owner at the time, that was the, of course, the owner's the grandfather of Sonia Chang. Uh, and I said to him, I said, you know, you have this amazing 2.2 kilometer of land. You really shouldn't just build this expected apartment complex and buildings and blocks after blocks. I said, why don't you consider building a park, like the Hyde Park, like the Central Park, and you can call it Victoria Park on the harbor. Uh, that is well defined within the 2.2 kilometer and defined it by you know the harbor drive east, west, north, and south, right? Only built along this road. And then looked at me and said, go away. I mean, you asking us to give the land away to the people? I said, absolutely. They said, no, go away. So that sort of diminished the project for me. That's many years ago. Uh, so this time around, the owner actually, the son, Henry says, hey, Tony, I remember that day. He says, uh, you think we're going to do something different this time? I said, well, we can build a garden. Forget the park. <laughs> <laughs> so we basically did the building from inside out. We were lucky working with the KPF. They're very accommodating. So we carved out about 17 gardens vertically uh, throughout the entire building because we do believe uh, human scale is important. Uh, oftentimes, we look at things in the millimeters. If I look out to the window, what do I want to see? Of course, you have the great Hong Kong Harbor view, but what about the layer in between them? What if I do a beautiful pine tree in between and using the harbor as a background? Right? So these are the things we, we did or we are doing uh, that makes the hotel quite unique. Which actually, um, so you know, everybody's obsessed with the Instagram-worthy moment. And you obviously are all about invisible design. So how does the Instagram-worthy moment fit into that philosophy, does it? Well, uh, not really. I, I think, you know, the thing we do, I mean, the thing you do as well, uh, it's, a, it's a continuation of things. It's emotion. The music does not stop at that particular moment. So Instagram usually capture that moment and everything else is not relevant. And I find that usually troublesome. However, when I do Instagram, I usually add a little more content to it. Uh, I like people to imagine the rest. You can look at one image, then the rest of it you need to imagine. So that you can use words, uh, you can use uh, anything to inspire, to, 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 to savor, to linger that flavor a bit longer. Absolutely. Now, there's a couple of questions that have come from the floor to date. Um, one of which is, it's saying here, what's your favorite project that you designed and why? And I would actually ask whether, um, whether, do you, whether you have a project that reflects you or, or best defines you and why. Uh, my studio, probably. Uh, I have a very unique studio for, for a great many years. Uh, it's very sizable uh, in a very good part of New York City. And the studio evolved my life for a great many years. At this juncture, or perhaps the last few years, I evolved it. Uh, I don't need that much space, but I didn't want to have a stranger in my studio. So I started creating new contents within it. Uh, I mean, for some of our partner and vendor in our industry, I created an amphitheater for them. So my, my wife, my partner in the studio said, why do you want to create an amphitheater? I said, you know, I, I feel sorry sometimes with these vendor come to see us and show us. They said, do you like it? I said, tell me why I shouldn't like it. So I put them on the podium. Um, I put them in the amphitheater. And they will do a lecture. And we'll, we'll learn something. If I don't learn anything, then I probably won't use it. If I learn something, voila, I can use it, right? So, so we go through this process. So the amphitheater is working really well. Not stressful at all for those su suppliers out in the audience. <laughs> Take note, designers. Might be a good thing to uh, implement in your studios. Um, do you have, uh, what's the biggest challenge that you've had to overcome on a project? It's another one from the audience. Cost and time. Always. That's for all uh, of us. Unfortunately, um, it's getting faster. Uh, things are becoming costly. Um, 
everyone wants more, um, the offerings less. So I don't know how to get more velocity out of anything we do. So, so in my case, I oftentimes try to balance it. Uh, many years ago, we did hotel 400 keys uh, in about a 100,000 square meter environment. Today, we do the same amount of 400 keys, maybe in half of the size. And the owner is looking at the same bottom line. You know, something just don't add up. Uh, so these are the things that I find probably the biggest challenge, and somehow we, I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, no, that's, that's true. Um, so that actually brings me to this question. Uh, you were credited as being the inventor of the feature glass-encased wine chiller in restaurants. This was back in 1997, which made a feature out of back of house, what's traditionally a back of house offering. Mm. Do you think that paved the way for show kitchens and fine dining restaurants? And do you think that, you know, your last comment here of trying to cram more into smaller spaces, do you think there's some value to, um, I suppose, exposing or highlighting, featuring, combining back of house elements with front of house elements in order to try and be a bit more efficient and creative with how we're using hotels and, and mm. the space we have available to us? Well, well that's a very good question. And I think, I, I tell you, I. I'm a, I'm a neither believer open kitchen or closed kitchen, and the only thing that matters to me are the people that are actually using the space. And who are the most important people that are using your space? Not necessarily the customers, but it's the staff. Uh, and I think the staff in that environment, eight, 10 hours a day, how do you make that better? How do you evolve with them? Uh, if they can evolve, they can build amazing culture in that space. And this space, as I call it, with the soul, right? And I often tell the staff, I say, I can only build the body and you must build the soul. Assuming if they stay to build. Uh, so I oftentimes take that seriously. I, I design probably the most, not lavish, but most functional back of the house, you call it back of the house, but I call it the front. I call it the engine of my building, the engine of my space. Uh, then everything else, I think, is a secondary to me. Uh, yes, oftentimes i being challenged by the owner because the amount of money that needs to be spent uh, for the staff uh, so oftentimes doesn't justify, it, and I will never back out or back down on that one. That's an interesting statement considering these days we're seeing even in, well, in, in particular in urban properties, back, back of house areas almost, staff areas, sorry, front of house engine areas mm -hmm. almost disappearing right. from projects. So that's an interesting, um, uh, certainly a valued uh, position. Now we've got other changes that we're seeing in the hotels at the moment, which is, um, for instance, the move to um, a really multifunctional, multi-use uh, multi and flexible lobby space that tries to be an office and a restaurant and a lounge. Um, you know, do you have an opinion about the changes that you're seeing that, that effectively have been started by lifestyle hotels and we're starting to see more and more throughout all of the, all of the various hotels at every, every level? Absolutely. I, I think I mentioned earlier about, about area program building, right? So in, in a better way to define is the content. You can't build a building without a content. You can't build a room without a content. So what is the content? We need to define what that means. Now, what you mentioned about having this sort of a multifunctional space, you know, it is a one way to justify this sort of uh, financial requirement uh, to prolong the operating hour. Hopefully, you meet the better bottom line, right? That's one way of looking at it. But, but the, re the reality is our social issue. Uh, as we know, the apartment private houses got smaller, you know, and the cost of living got higher. Uh, I'll I, I don't know about Melbourne, but in New York, uh, I find the younger generation out of college, they're really suffering. I mean, they don't really have the privilege that we had, um, you know, 40 years ago. Uh, really get to enjoy and explore the city the way it should. Uh, most of the people have a dormitory living in New York. They're sharing apartments. Uh, they, they have nowhere else to go. So they go to public environment, places like Starbucks coffee. Uh, you know, they offer you free Wi-Fi uh, with a cup of coffee with a pa in a paper cup, and they hang out for four or five hours. So, so these are the things that are driving the human behavior, is driving uh, some of uh, the operator to seeking that as an opportunity. Uh, and, and I don't know what, how far that will go, but I usually handle it very differently. And then most recently, I sort of take on the approach, uh, not necessarily building a hotel, but building 
a neighborhood. You know, hotel is an environment telling people don't come in, right? It's like a fortress. So I said, how do we break down the wall and let it be a neighborhood, right? So who needs a lobby to impress anyone? So what if I uh, said, no, which is, or I say, Rizzoli Bookstore, I said, why don't you come in with me? Why don't I build you an amazing bookstore in my lobby? You know, you're talking about roughly 2,000 square meter bookstore. And the people can just be in the bookstore. I don't care if they buy anything. But this bookstore, uh, you can play pl classical music. It has a library table. Uh, of course, there's a coffee shop. You can buy coffee. Uh, and it's a one way of creating a new concept in urban environment, right? Then at the same time, you say, well, the back of the house, uh, typically, as you know, you have commissary. I said, what if we build an urban market, like your Victoria Market, we bring all the goodies together, all the people together, and they can do the wholesale venturing, right? So if they do the wholesale, that can bring the masses there, and we get the benefit of, of the, the in between. So, so these are the things I think it makes a very interesting uh, environment to define perhaps the new urban hotel nowadays. Absolutely. Are you seeing a demand? Uh, you know, some of the conversations this morning were around healthy um, environments in hotels, around biophilia, sustainability, closed circle recycling. Are you seeing a demand for that in the projects you're working on? Uh, well, that, absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, the health issue have a lot to do with uh, maturity of a country and of a city. Uh, we're talking about health uh, because we're afraid of dying. But the, the, the matter of fact, it is not about we're afraid of dying, it's that we're afraid of being sick, right? Being sick is a lot worse than dying. So, so most of the people in this city, they realize that. There's a certain quality of life they wish to maintain, uh, whether yoga classes have increased, uh, their diet pr preference and whatnot. Of course, the vendors are taking advantage of that as well. I mean, look at Whole Foods, right? They have the whole organic section, but it's only 5% organic uh, you know, to all this. So how organic is it, and what does that mean? Uh, and I think today I hear something actually quite inspirational, and the fault is that all of us, because we just don't know what we don't know. Uh, and I think this is an interesting subject for us to explore a little bit more, so maybe we'll learn something from it. Absolutely. Now, you've worked in Sydney and Melbourne in your past. Yes, I did. A while ago. <laughs> um, how do you think Sydney and Belmo Melbourne compete on the world, world stage in terms of hospitality and uh, restaurant design? Do you, think we're, do you think we are competing? Do you think we're behind? Do you think we're ahead of the curve? Well, you know, I, I think Sydney, Melbourne, uh, intellectually, culturally, is absolutely uh, an, an, an undiscovered uh, oasis in the world. Um, perhaps it's geographic problem, uh, the isolation things, but f the, from the people, from the behavior, from, uh, from your ability, uh, this city is absolutely capable of the on, on the world stage, perhaps even more, mainly because your rhythm uh, is better. But how much better, I don't know. As you know, the city got much faster nowadays. Uh, New York is completely out of the ball game because it's not not, the place is not livable. Uh, the rhythm is much, much too fast. Uh, so it's not considered quality. At this point now, I think uh, Melbourne 20 years ago is a bit sleepy, uh, so all the places were bespoke, uh, which I love. Uh, nowadays, it's become a main street, so it's becoming more common to everyone. And I think something like this, uh, we had that once upon a time, perhaps 25 years ago in New York, and that had all faded away. So you still have it, so you're on the top of the world. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously that's a caution as well, right? <laughs> Let's yes. not get too fast. Um, okay, so I've got a, two more questions, then we'll turn it to the floor for questions. Mm -hmm. So get your questions ready. Um, what wisdom can you impart on, so we've got designers and operators, suppliers in the, room, in the room. So what wisdom can you impart on the next generation of designers in the room, and what wisdom can you impart on the, on the next, well, on the hoteliers that are in the room? Well, I think uh, for the designer, first of all, uh, if you choose to, be to, to have this life, uh, you need to evaluate what's important. Uh, is your life that is important or is your work? Or do you wish to say, well, I only have one life. How do I combine them to have a better life? Uh, 
you know, design business, as I said earlier, before, I made that very, I made that decision very early onwards. Uh, I didn't chase the business of design because I didn't wish to be so profited uh, with that design know-how. Uh, then one day I may dislike design altogether. So I like design, therefore I using the other model and the business model to keep it sustainable. So I think for the designer, you really have to somehow know where you want to go. I think that both model works. Uh, it's just a matter of what you like. Uh, from the hotel side of it, uh, I, I, he I heard that this morning, which is quite good about hotel can't get away with the cookie cutter approach anymore. Uh, you know, those big, big brand, at the end of the day, I want to say same shit, right? They're all the same, uh, you know, because people move around so much these days. Right, so it's nobody stay on one job. So you have the people that work for the Four Seasons that move to another hotel brand. So do they actually physically move or did they move the culture with it? I, I question that all the time. Of course, nowadays we have to look at, also another factor is not great many people wish to be in the service industry anymore. So therefore, uh, the, the staff ratio to a guest room have dropped significantly. And years ago, we had staff ratio to a guest room could be five, six to one. And today, I mean, Hong Kong, you may look at a 1.5 to one. New York, it's really 0.5 to one. Uh, so, so what kind of service do you want to get, right? So how uh, self-contained you need to be when you are in a in public environment? Do we actually create the necessary amenity for the self-serve? Right? These are the things that oftentimes that I think we are, we are at the crossroad with that. Are there any questions from the floor? Tony, thanks for your talk. It was very inspiring. Um, very curious, given the breadth of work you do and uh, the time your clients afford I can't you. hear you very well. Sorry. Uh, I'm very curious about the time uh, your clients afford you to create and mm. develop your wonderful ideas. Uh, do you have any mantras around uh, how you edit uh, your ideas uh, or philosophies around how you edit when you approach a, a design? Uh, can you your, uh, how, how you, you edit, edit your design ideas? How you edit your design ideas. Well, well uh, sorry, I just couldn't hear you very well. My apology. Uh, I think the editing process is an ongoing thing. First of all, all my projects takes about minimum five years, and some projects takes about 15. Park High Shanghai took us about... Uh, I want to say maybe 12, 13 years. Uh, Rosewood Hong Kong was nine years. Uh, Rosewood, uh, Hong Kong, yeah, nine years. Rosewood London was, a, was a 10 or 11 years. So all these projects, you do have plenty of time to, to reflect and to continue editing. But again, in today's climate, uh, you have this scenario that you tender the project, you lock in with a number, then you basically build whatever you got on that paper. I, I usually won't let that happen. I usually allow certain leeway, uh, allow me to continue edit them. So I have a particular way of designing the project. I break them into two parts. Part one is called the fit out part. I call it the white box. I build the white box as well as I can. And this white box is what I tell the owners. Uh, that you will spend the money to build this white box with a bathroom in the right place and all quality that you will never have to rip that apart. It hopefully will stay around for hundreds of years, okay? I don't care which interior designer comes in 10 years later and you have to tell them you can change everything, but you cannot touch the wall, you cannot break the wall, you cannot break the bathroom, okay? So by doing that, you allow the interior designer to think creatively how to define the FFE package. You know, the FFE package does not limit it to table and chairs. You can have a clip-on wall paneling system that defines the room. It can be decorative, right? It can be architecturally appearance. So you can have all these elements define the room. And so I usually do that during the second part. That allow me to continue editing the design throughout the course of the job. Well, is that I it? I think that's it. Yes, all right. Well, please, a wonderful round of applause for Tony Chi and his amazing insight.